All right, guys, welcome back. And uh, as you know, as I know you know, we have a final exam coming up, right? And uh, a good way to practice is that I've put a practice exam up on uh, Blackboard Learn. So there's a practice exam already up there. The solutions to the practice exam will be posted tonight at midnight. Please, 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 before you look at the solution set, give yourself every opportunity to make this into a good study experience. So I highly recommend that you take the practice exam and you just give yourself the practice exam like regular testing conditions, okay? Carve out a two hour block where nobody's gonna interrupt you. Shut the door, tell your roommates not to disturb you. Get yourself some pizza so you're nice and set up and you don't need to be interrupted. And for two solid hours, just take that practice exam, okay? For real. And then when you know what your answers really, really, really are, after that, check our solution set. Then you will know, then you've used it as a diagnostic tool to tell you which pieces of the material you need to study more and which pieces you're pretty good on, okay? Not that you shouldn't also study those, all right? But it gives you an opportunity to know which pieces you really need to focus on. And then you can go into WebAssign and find those practice problems, all right? And practice the ones that you need extra help with. You may even spot a pattern, right? Oftentimes what we find if a student misses, say, five questions on the exam, oftentimes what we'll find is that they're all kind of in the same category. Sometimes they're all about the same set of material. Sometimes there's something else that's biting you, like maybe you're not drawing diagrams carefully. So maybe sometimes you might figure out that, oh, if I had just drawn my diagrams carefully, I would have gotten those five questions correct. Or maybe you'll find out that, oh, what, what, what got me on those five problems is that I wasn't thinking very carefully about the vectors, which again usually goes back to drawing your diagrams really carefully. So take that practice exam, okay? Give yourself a full two hours, take it, see how you personally do, and then use it as a diagnostic to help you know how to spend your study time. Then you'll make the best use of your study time. The right way to study at this point, okay, is, is the book, I'm assuming you already read. And if at this point in the, in the class you haven't read those chapters yet, the right way to recover from that is to just dive in and do problems, okay? Solving the problems is what's gonna help you solve problems on the final exam. Okay. All right, so study hard and good luck. Remember, the better you do, the better we feel about ourselves as teachers. So we, we want you to do well, because we want to have taught you well. Um, and so, so do well, okay? Study hard, we good go. luck. Okay. So last time in class, we discussed Faraday's Law. We learned all about Faraday's Law. This time, we're going to get to the entire complete set of Maxwell's equations. So we will finish out everything that's known about electricity and magnetism. Well, not everything that's known, but we'll, we'll, we will finish out the equations that govern it, okay? Working out the consequences is actually very hard, but we'll finish out the equations that govern it, and we'll have the complete set of equations that govern everything having to do with electricity and magnetism. And if we have time for it, I'll show you the wave solution of those guys. So here's what we've had when we were talking about the time-independent pieces of Maxwell's equations. So what I mean by time-independent is the steady-state case, okay? So this was a case where we had charges, and we could have charges moving as long as they were moving at constant velocity, which we report in Maxwell's equations as a constant current. So in the steady-state case, these are Maxwell's equations. What we did last week, though, was we said, okay, these places where there's a big fat zero, we're going to update. Okay, last week in chapter 23, we updated this piece and said, well, look, a changing magnetic flux with time can cause a curling electric field. That was, that was Faraday's law. And so we updated this piece. That's not a steady state piece, right? That's got a time dependence to it. So what it told us was that if there's a magnetic flux and that magnetic flux changes with time, it causes electric fields to curl around itself. What we're going to see today is that this part here, Ampere's law, also needs to be updated with a time-dependent piece. So Ampere's law told us that I can get a curling magnetic field if I have a current. So a current running causes a magnetic field to curl around itself. But by analogy with Faraday's law, you might think, well, look, a changing magnetic flux, just a changing magnetic flux caused a curling electric field. Maybe a changing electric flux causes a curling magnetic field, okay? And this is exactly the insight that, that James Clerk Maxwell had. So this was called Ampere's Law, but if you add in that time-dependent piece that we'll study today, this was, this was Maxwell's big idea, that, that now that's the complete set of equations for electricity and magnetism. 
So this piece was added by James Clerk Maxwell. And everyone agrees this was a great leap of genius to do this. He was thinking about the symmetry of these things. Actually, he also reports that he was thinking very deep, deeply about the concept of Trinity. So he was having deeply spiritual thoughts while he was trying to, to solve these equations. And you can't, <laughs> it's impossible to overemphasize the importance of having put this term in, OK? So once Maxwell did that, that's the complete description of electricity and magnetism. This is, if you have this stuff in place, you can predict all the other things you need to know. So for example, if you just took this piece of lecture and you said, OK, I got it. I, got, I, got, I wrote these equations down. And now hop into your time machine, because I know you keep one in your garage, right? So hop into your time machine and go back in time 300 years. You would change the world, right? You would have in your power to do things like, oh my goodness, based on this, I can create, um, I can create uh, uh, telegraphs, all right? I can set up a whole telegraph system of telegrams. And this is what these equations right here are what enabled us. This is why we, um, a as a world, laid down that big old cable in the Atlantic Ocean connecting uh, two continents and allowing telegraph communications. That was enabled by Maxwell's equations. This is what enabled the telephone, okay? So communications over, whether they're over wires or, or without wires. So this enables your cell phone technology. It enables everything from the electronic circuits that are inside the little chips that you can't see, all right, to the wireless communications that let your phone connect with the cell phone towers. It also enables light. So the fact that light is propagating in this room is controlled by these equations. Radio, OK? Um, so radio communications are enabled by having put all these pieces together. Satellite communications, I mean, our entire you know, modern society basically is founded on these equations up here. You can't overemphasize it. Could Maxwell possibly have foreseen all of the societal implications of figuring this out? No way, all right? Did he know he was going to make a global society by having done that? Nope. So who knows, all right? If you decide to you know, switch into, into basic sciences and do something pretty amazing like that, who knows what the implications will be for your work in the future as well. Actually, I should also tell you, since you're sitting right here in Purdue, all right, there's um, once a long, long, long time ago, um, there was a man here named Edward Purcell who got his Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering at Purdue. And he went on to get a Nobel Prize all right, so sitting amongst you right here, maybe there's another Nobel Prize winner right now um, who's going to do something else amazing like that. All right, so adding time to Ampere's Law, what do we need to do to do that? We had Ampere's Law last week and the previous weeks, but it didn't have explicit time dependence other than the current. The current was assumed to be steady state. All right, so now let's think about what happens if we think of well, let me set up a conundrum first. So first I'll set up a paradox, and then let me show you how Maxwell solved the paradox. So here's Ampere's law, which as we know is incomplete. It doesn't have explicit time dependence other than that steady state current. But if things are changing with time, we're going to get a, a contradiction. So the law stated in this way gives a paradox. Let's say that we apply this to a capacitor, all right? So what this equation means, what Ampere's law means, is that if there's a current running, there's a magnetic field curling around it, OK? So current running, magnetic field curling around it, current running, magnetic field curls around it. What happens when we get to a capacitor, all right? When we get to a capacitor, if current's running and gets to the capacitor, the current doesn't go through the capacitor, right? The current just charges up the plates. So think of it very much like uh, a water hose carrying water up to a bucket, and then it dumps the water in the bucket, OK? So let's think then of applying this to a capacitor. So what do the equations tell us? The equations say the line integral of the magnetic field looped back around itself. Anytime you see a circle on an integral, it is something that's closed. It's a closed integral. So this is a closed line integral. comes back to itself. Um, and so I take that line integral. And what I've told you before is that this current enclosed, here's the way you know whether the current's enclosed or not. Take the path that the line integral is going to go over. Pretend that that's a bubble wand, OK? Now you're going to take that wand and dip it in bubble solution. And then the soap film that comes out of that, if, if a current pierces that soap film, it counts, all right? So when we had the big long wire and we thought about taking the line integral of magnetic field along the big long wire, clearly the current cut the soap film. We counted that as I enclosed. And we knew that we had to have a curling magnetic field around it. So now do that here in the capacitor. 
oh, we get something kind of strange, all right? So what this law would tell us is that if the soap film passes in between the plates of the capacitor, there's no current piercing the soap film. If there's no current piercing the soap film, we would get zero contribution. And we would find that the integral, the line integral of b dot dl, around the boundary of our soap film, right, around the bubble wand itself, would give us zero. But now let's take the same soap film and we're just going to blow on it a little bit, OK? So just blow on it a little bit, extend it so that it passes the capacitor and now catches some of the current. OK, so it's the same bubble wand. I've just deformed the soap bubble a little bit. I can do that. The math allows that, OK? So we deform that. And now we're catching some current. Now we'd get a current enclosed. And now we would find that integral b dot dl is not 0, OK? And this actually, this makes much more sense. Because who, you know, who, how could I possibly say that all this current leading up to the capacitor and this large curling magnetic field around it, it's not going to just go away when I get to the capacitor. Okay? So the curling magnetic field continues on unabated. So this is what we call a paradox. Right? We've got a contradiction in these lines of reasoning. And so something is amiss. The equation has to be updated. And what's missing is the time-dependent term that Maxwell added to these equations. So here's what we need to do to fix it. We're going to add time to Ampere's law. And what we're going to see is that we need to take into account that while the capacitor is charging, the electric field inside of the capacitor is increasing, which means there's a region of space where the electric flux is increasing. So that time-dependent electric flux is what's going to save the day. So let's calculate the electric flux inside the capacitor. And then we'll calculate the time derivative of the electric flux. And we'll see that it's the piece we need to solve the puzzle. So inside of a capacitor, the electric field is 1 over epsilon naught q over a. All right? And this is the electric field deep inside a, par a large parallel plate capacitor. You know there are also fringe fields that are uh, typically ne negligible. So we'll focus on this piece that's deep inside the capacitor. So the electric flux now through our surface, all right, what we're showing here, the dotted line, is where the soap film is now inside the capacitor. And I've got the ring. OK, over which I'm going to measure b dot dl is far away from this. All right. So the piece of the electric field then that contributes is not over the entire area of the soap film, but it's only going to be where there's actually strong electric field. So here, integral e dot nda is going to end up being the electric field inside the capacitor times the area of those plates. So e times a. And that gives me the e itself inside of a capacitor is q over epsilon naught a times this area of the capacitor plate, that's the flux. Okay, That's the electric flux through that surface. And now the A's cancel, and I get Q over epsilon naught, where this Q now refers to the charge on a plate. It's not where our soap film is, but it's the charge that's next to the soap film. So now find the time derivative of that. So now I need d by dt of electric flux, which is just going to be d by dt of Q over epsilon naught. Epsilon naught's a constant. It comes out of the derivative. And dq by dt, you might remember, is current. Okay? It's just another way to state current. Current is charge per unit time moving by, which is formally a time derivative of the charge. So dq by dt gives me current. And again, this is current in the wire, not on the surface. So it's something that's happening nearby the surface, not right on the surface. But the current that's coming up to the capacitor is charging the capacitor. And as the capacitor charges, the electric field inside of it grows. And so of course we can then attribute right, the current coming in is what gives me the changing electric flux inside. So that's, that's why those are determining each other. So the flux inside kind of takes the place of the current. So if I add then in this piece here, epsilon naught d by dt integral e dot nda, that gives me the full Ampere's law, okay, which now gets to be called the Ampere-Maxwell law. Uh, so basically, in, uh, outside the capacitor, so if I think now of the geometry we had before, where I had, uh, I'm going to be taking integral b dot l around a line, right, a closed line, that then forms like the ring of a bubble wand, dip that in bubble solution and take the soap film. So now, whether the soap film uh, goes straight through the capacitor or whether the soap film is extended a little bit to go beyond the capacitor and catch the current, either way, it's going to give us the same integral b dot l. So, the soap, so going back to our geometry here, right, the soap film will either catch the changing electric flux 
in between the parallel plates of the capacitor, in which case, bam, it gives the right contribution. Or if we deform it a little bit, it'll catch that uh, current piercing it. So independent of which contribution it catches, it still gives the right integral b dot dl. Okay? So that completes the equation. Do you have any questions about that so far? Okay. All right, so this is now the full form. That's the Ampere-Maxwell law that was the last piece in the equations. Um, so this, this is it. This completes it. This, this slide now, this is the slide that if you snatched it and you ran back in time 300 years, you too could transform society, okay? So this is everything there is to know about electricity and magnetism. It's contained in those four laws. We also implicitly need the force law, right? Because the force law forces QE plus QV cross B. That tells us how these electric and magnetic fields affect charges. And it tells us how charges affect electric and magnetic fields, OK? So all that together is everything we need to know. And as we said, this basically empowers a global society, right? It gives us everything from light to radio communications to wireless communications to the internet, OK? Everything you need to know to run the power grid, everything you need to know to make motors and all that great stuff, everything you need to know to make uh, integrated circuits. Do you have any questions so far? Okay. This is our last piece of the puzzle. Now, okay, it's got a star because this is it. And I just want to remind you of the pieces that are in here, okay? <laughs> so, of course, as a theoretical physicist, I like math, and you know, so some people look at the Mona Lisa and think that's you know a very beautiful thing. I look, I also agree that's a very beautiful thing. But I look at Maxwell's equations, and I have the same you know reaction some people have to the Mona Lisa or to a beautiful sunset. I go, oh, that's just the prettiest thing I've ever seen. So, it is. It's so pretty. Okay. So what's pretty about it, right? So so what is it? I've got two different kinds of integrals. Okay. So I've got uh, a flux type of integral. Okay, so this is about areas, so flux through areas, and these are enclosed areas. And I get one for the electric field and one for the magnetic field, so it's nice and balanced. That's very symmetric, that's very beautiful. And I have two, another kind of integral for curl, okay, so a line integral that curls back around itself, okay, this is, tells me about curling electric fields and curling magnetic fields, and they're balanced, there's one of each, so, so that's very symmetric as well. And now I have this nice symmetry here as well between changing fluxes, okay? So this is the magnetic flux, and if it changes, if the magnetic flux changes, it causes a curling electric field. And then we know over here, if the electric flux changes, it causes a curling magnetic field, and so forth. I should also remind you of how these integrals are related to each other, right? This closed line integral, all right, makes uh, essentially like the, the rim of a bubble wand, and then a soap film going through it, that's this area here. And you can deform that soap film, and the math still works. Okay, So this area is just some area that ends on the rim defined by that. Same thing here. So they're very beautiful equations. And you can already see you could kind of get a feedback effect once you have these two time-dependent terms there. right? So let's just think about kickstarting something. So let me just kind of kickstart a magnetic field somewhere. And I'm going to have a region of space with a changing magnetic flux. OK, that changing magnetic flux causes an electric field to curl around itself. Okay? So, and once you start a curling electric field, well, now you've got a changing electric field. So you've got a changing electric field. There's some region where there's a changing electric flux. Well, that changing electric flux starts off a curling magnetic field. And the curling magnetic field is now changing, which means there's a changing magnetic flux somewhere, which goes on, it, says it just loops back around, right? This causes that to happen, causes that to happen, causes that to happen, and so forth. So you can already see how you can get something that, that is a self-propagating wave. And if we have time at the end of the lecture, I'll show that to you. The next thing I'd like to show you, though, is how to convert these guys into their differential form. So here I'm going to take a different um, path from your book. Okay, I'm going to skip to the end of the book and show you how to convert these integral equations into differential equations. Once we get the differential equations in place, you remember I've already told you how to solve differential equations, right? When you get a differential equation, you knock on the door of the math department and you say, here's my differential equation. What's the solution, please, mathematicians? And they tell you what's the solution, if it's solved, right? There are differential equations out there that we don't know solutions to yet. But if it's a solved equation, you ask the math department. So what we'll see is that when we convert these guys into their differential form, we'll get a differential equation that turns out to be the wave equation. 
All right? So we'll see that we can actually just predict light waves, electromagnetic waves, out of this stuff. So let me show you how to get the differential form. Basically, it amounts to taking derivatives of these integral equations. But let me show you how to do that in the very controlled calculus methods that you already know. Okay, When you're going to take a, a calculus limit, what you need to do is you, is you define geometries, and then you're going to shrink those geometries down. And then in the limit, calculus happens, right? So let's think about Gauss's law first. So Gauss's law tells me that I need to think about some sort of charge, OK? And then if I enclose that charge with an area, the electric flux poking through that area is directly uh, proportional to the amount of charge that's inside the, the enclosed area. So now think about a geometry that's going to be easy to take limits of, right? If I'm going to take a calculus limit, set up the geometry to be easy. So in this case, I'm going to think about a region of space enclosed in a box. Now I'm going to make the box a nice square box, OK? So it's, it's, got, it's, it's um, got a delta x that's lined up on the x-axis. A delta y is the, the um, distance along the y-axis. Delta z is the distance of this box along the z-axis. And I want to think about taking Gauss's law and just d divide it by the volume of that box, OK? So I take the electric flux, divide it by delta v. I take the right-hand side, 1 over epsilon naught, charge enclosed and divide that by delta V. So far, I haven't done anything magical. I just divided Gauss's law by delta V. Okay. Next, some calculus is going to happen. So now I want to take the limit that that volume goes to 0. And as that happens, we'll see that some differential equations come out. So take the limit as delta V goes to 0. Okay. On the right-hand side here, as I take the limit that delta V goes to 0, I'm going to enclose less and less charge. All right, but in the limit, that, that becomes charge density. So this is charge per unit volume. And I'm just taking a smaller and smaller volume. And that becomes rho, where rho is charge per unit volume. That's, just, that's what charge density means. Okay? So this becomes charge density. Okay? That's just by definition. Do you have any questions about that part? Okay? So that's just by definition. D does no questions mean we're good, or I need to spend more time on it? Okay? We good? Going to go on? OK, all right, I'm seeing some thumbs up. So work on the left-hand side of the equation now. And that gives me integral e dot d n dA over delta V. But I'm going to take the limit now as the volume goes small. All right. So now I go back to my geometry. OK, 50% of physics is drawing your diagrams really carefully. So now I just look back at my diagram. OK, I've set things up in a way that's going to be easy to calculate. I set things up so that I have an electric field that's only in the x direction in this region of space. Okay? And I've set my box up so that it's along the x, y, and z axes. And so I, ha I have a case that's easy to calculate the electric flux. So there's pieces of the electric flux that are on, say, this plane or that plane, and there's no contribution, right? Parallel nets catch no fish. So when the electric field is parallel to the area, there's no flux contribution. So I'm only going to get a flux contribution from the back end here, where EX is poking into it, and from the front end here, where EX is poking out of it. So let me take this piece first. This gives me a contribution. I've labeled it over here E2. Okay, That's what's coming out of this side of the box. And what's the area it's poking over? Can you kind of just see from my diagram? This, this E2 is poking over. What's the area of that square? I set it up to be easy. So what's the, what's the area of that square right there? Yeah, exactly. So it's delta y times delta z. That gives me the area. So that's right here. That's e2 times delta y delta z. On the back side, which you can't quite see in the diagram, on the back side, it's the same area, but the flux is coming in. Flux coming out gives a positive contribution. Flux coming in gives a negative contribution. So there's this negative e1 delta y delta z. Okay? The other thing I'm going to do is write down the volume of the box in terms of delta x delta y delta z. What's the volume of my box in terms of delta y, delta x, and delta z? Yeah, I just multiply them together, right? So delta x times delta y times delta z, that's the volume of this box. That goes right there. And you might see already all right, that I have a delta y divided by a delta y and a delta z divided by a delta z. So I'm just going to cancel them. Cancel, cancel. And now my limit of delta v, so as the volume shrinks down, What's shrinking is delta x, delta y, and delta z are shrinking all at once. 
All I'm writing down over here is the limit as delta x goes to 0, because I didn't have any delta y or delta z dependence left. Okay? So limit as delta x goes to 0 of e2 minus e1 over delta x. That right there, if you're a math major, you're very excited, because if you're a math major, you say, that's a derivative. Okay? I know what that is. So let me just remind you of the definition of a derivative. All right? So the definition of a derivative, df by dx, is defined as, the three bars mean defined as, limit as delta x goes to 0, delta f over delta x, which you could also write as the limit of uh, f2 minus f1 over x2 minus x1, the limit as the distance between the points goes to 0. Graphically, if this is a graph of f of x, some function versus x, so there's the squiggle, and this is point 1 and point 2, what this is telling you is take rise divided by run, and then take the limit as those pieces go together, which gives you the local slope. So I hope all that's familiar from your calculus class, right? And then you can look at that calculus definition and say, oh, I have a limit as delta x goes to 0 of the electric field, OK? Difference in electric field divided by delta x. And I take that limit, it gives me a derivative. So by definition, then, this is dex over dx. Okay? So I know it's a d by dx because there's a delta x in the denominator. How did I know to put this as the x component? That's how I set up the problem. Okay? I set up a physical situation where my electric field is parallel to x. Okay? So that's why there's an x sitting there. Right? But that's, the, that's how this flux is going through that box. And what we've seen now so far is that, OK, this side of the equation has turned into dE by dx. And now that equals rho over epsilon naught. Do you have any questions so far? <coughs> OK. All right. Complaints or thoughts or OK. All right. Now I, I set this up in the x direction. And because I set it up in the x direction, I got a dEx by dx. If I had set this up in the y direction, I would have had a dEy by dy. If I'd set it up in the z direction, I would have had a dEz by dz. So in a general case, all those guys contribute. And I get dEx by dx plus dEy by dy plus dEz by dz is rho over epsilon naught. <clears throat> okay? And then there's a nice shorthand for saying, well, when I'm taking the x derivative, I care about the piece that's parallel to x. Okay? When I take the y derivative, I care about the piece that's parallel to y. That's because in going from the back of the box to the front of the box, I walked along the x-axis. And I needed to know the flux that was parallel to x. So that's why I got a derivative with respect to x there. Okay? So there's a shorthand for this, which is called del dot e. All right? And del itself is a, um, is a vector derivative, d by dx of the x components, d by dy of the y components, d by dz of the z components. And the shorthand is del dot e, but you can always just remember the longhand as well. All right? So what that means is, Take a derivative in the following way. Walk along the x direction and measure how much did the, did the electric field parallel to my step, how much did that change? Okay, now take a step in the y direction and look only at the electric field parallel to my step, how much did that change? Now step up in the z direction and look only at the electric field parallel to my step, how much did that change? All that together is what's called the divergence, actually, of the electric field. And that's the differential form of Gauss's law. Do you have any questions about that? OK. How about the, the curly signs in the, in the uh, derivatives? Have you guys seen curly signs before? OK. So let me rem if you haven't, I see a lot of heads nodding. So some of you have. If you haven't seen the curly signs, let me just tell you what it means. It's, it's, it's actually um, uh, not bad at all. Um, the curly sign here for, you know, usually you see a d there, dE by dx. I've got a curly D. The reason is to remind you that when you're working on this term, you only take the derivative with respect to x and ignore anything with respect to y or z. And when you get to this term, you only take the derivative with respect to y and ignore any z or x dependence and so forth. Okay? So it just means do one at a time. That's all it means. Questions? All right. And sometimes this is called a parallel derivative. Okay. So that gave us, that was a lot of math, but what we did was we converted the integral form of Gauss's law into the differential form. And in fact, sometimes I said this is called a divergence 
because of the following idea, if I have a charge density that's a, a point charge, for example, all right, and then I think of how do the electric field lines come off of that, the electric field lines come out in such a way that they diverge, right? They come out and they spread apart. That's diverging. And so this del dot E captures that piece of the electric field that's diverging. All right, the differential form of Ampere's law. So here's Ampere's law, all right? Integral, line integral of B dot DL around a closed loop is equal to the sum of the currents that are piercing the area uh, inside the closed loop plus any time derivatives of the electric flux through that soap film that attaches to the closed loop. That's Ampere's law. So now, again, half of physics is writing diagrams carefully. I'm going to carefully set up a diagram here to where I can take a calculus limit and get the differential form. So here I have current I coming out of the board towards you. And I'm going to let integral b dot dl be this nice square. I'm going to take a nice square path so I can easily take the calculus limit. So I'll go along step one, step two, step three, step four. x-axis is horizontal, y-axis is vertical, and z is out of the board towards you. So now, think of applying Ampere's law to this case. Okay? Integral b dot dl will be around that path. I have an I enclosed. All right, there could also be electric flux, so we'll keep that term as well. And what I want to do is divide all of Ampere's law by the tiny area associated with that square that I wrote down. So delta A represents that area of the square. So I'll have limit as delta A goes to 0 of integral b dot l over delta A. Okay? And then again, I'm just going to then take the limit as that area goes small. That's what calculus always does. So on the right-hand side here, I have current. Okay? I'm going to rewrite current as current density. Okay? Current density is current per unit area. And so if I take current density, which is current per unit area, and then multiply it by area, I get back current. So current is current density times area. All right? So that's sitting right here. Divide all of that by delta A, the area. Okay? And then the third term was d by dt integral e dot nda. And again, I'm just going to divide that by delta A. Then I'm going to take over the whole thing. So I took the whole equation, divided by delta A. Now I'm going to take the limit that delta A gets small. And I'll do the same thing I did before, re-express delta A in terms of things that are in uh, the diagram. So let me do a little bit more simplification here first. This j dot n, all right, I'm going to now say in my geometry that what I care about is the flux coming through the board, right? So I've defined an area, all right? And our area, it's, it's n, the, the normal to that area is along the z-axis. So now if I identify n as z hat, I need to take j dot n, which becomes jz, and I need to take e dot n, which becomes ez. So it's the z component of the electric field comes down. Any questions so far? All right. OK, does no questions mean we're doing OK, or I need to talk about something more? Just, just give me a little thumbs up or a thumbs down if you want me to. Thumbs up means keep going. Thumbs down means I've got a question. OK? We good? All right. Seeing a lot of thumbs up. All right. So cancel the A's, all right? Cancel the A's. Cancel the A's there. And take the limit as delta A goes to 0. So now the right-hand side became mu naught jz. There it is. And the right-hand side over here, all the a's fell out. So the limit as delta a goes to 0 was easy in this case. Again, I'm just shrinking that loop down. And I get dez by dt times mu naught epsilon naught. So it's this left-hand side we're going to have to work on. Okay? So this equation I'm going to copy on the next slide. There it is, copied straight down. And the thing we need to uh, work on now is the left-hand side. So work on the left-hand side. You see that's a bunch of math, but before we get to the bunch of math, what's going to come out is derivatives, all right? So that's the purpose of what we're doing. We've divided by a delta A. We're going to take the limit as delta A goes to zero. We'll find the derivatives based on the definition of a derivative over here, and then that'll, that'll tell us that these are the derivatives, okay? So let's work on this. We'll massage this guy a little bit. So I have limit as delta A goes to 0 of line integral b dot dl over delta A, right? So now I need to just look up my carefully drawn, drawn diagram, right? Half of physics is carefully drawing your diagram. So I have segment 1, 2, 3, and 4. And so now, what does integral b dot dl mean? It means walk around that loop, right? So I walk around that loop and, loop and I take b dot dl at every step. 
So one of the steps is along segment one, all right? So along segment one, I'm going to take a step in the dx direction, and I'll take the magnetic field that's parallel to me. So I'm at position one, so I call that B1, and I'm taking the component of magnetic field that's parallel to my step, which means I need the x component. So that's B1 comma x, just means x component, all right? And then times delta x, there's the delta x. That was the first leg. The next leg is we're going to walk up. So now walk up in the y direction. And so I take a delta y step up, there's the delta y, times the magnetic field at that spot, which is B2, just according to how I drew the diagram. And I need the y component of that. So that's here, B2y times delta y. Right? Now the third leg is up top. Now I'm going to walk backwards along the x-axis. So I'm taking a step now in the minus delta x direction. Right? So there's a minus delta x right there for that. Which piece am I picking up? I'm picking up B3. That's just magnetic field at position 3. So I take a minus delta x step. I need the component that's parallel to the x direction, which is B3x. So there it is, B3x. There's a minus sign because I walked backwards. Now I'll walk here, and I'm going to walk down along the y-axis. Okay? As I walk down along the y-axis, I get a minus delta y contribution times the magnetic field at position 4 in the y direction. So that's all that numerator right there. Okay? Delta A, I'm going to re-express in terms of delta y and delta x. What's the area of my square in terms of delta x and delta y? You can just read it off the diagram, right? So what's the, what's the area of my square? Yeah, I'm hearing some whispers here of delta x, delta y. That's just how I set it up. So this area becomes delta x, delta y. And now you can see in this first term here, delta x will cancel delta x. So now I just have a delta y, and this, this first term is here. The second term is going to land there. So the first term here, delta x canceled. And for the limit as, as delta a goes to 0, what that really means is shrink delta x to 0 while I shrink delta y to 0. Okay. And in this term, I don't have a delta x left, so the, I already took the limit. And what's left is this delta y, right? And then over here, I have b2y minus b4y. The 2 and the 4 just represent where we are in the diagram. And the delta y is canceled, so I have an over delta x. And I have the limit as delta x goes to 0, all right? So this guy right here, I can spot as the definition of a derivative. Same thing here, all right? <clears throat> so in, in, in looking here, I have, again, a function difference in a function divided by the space distance that I walked, and the limit is that space distance goes to 0. That's this again. It's rise over run. Okay? It's rise over run of the magnetic field in the x direction. Okay? And in fact, it's about how, it how the y component is changing. So this piece right here becomes d by dx of by, because notice the y was there, so just carry the y over. This piece right here becomes d by dy of bx. So bx is right here, d by dy. All right? Now, um, because of how I set things up, this guy has a minus sign in front. That's actually, um, that's actually physical. And so what does this mean? Okay? This is called a crossed derivative because I'm taking a d by dx of the y component. And I'm taking uh, a d by dy of the x component. So let me just tell you what it means physically. Okay? This guy right here, okay, this x component says d by dx. d by dx means as I walk along the x direction. Okay? So as I walk along the x direction, I'm taking a derivative of by. By is pointing in the y-axis, right? So if by is here at this spot, and then if by changes to this at this spot, I just got a derivative in by, right? It's a change in by. That's what that term's about. So this is called a crossed derivative. All right, and in fact, um, in this case here, it's about z components. All right, so this can be re-expressed as del cross b. It's a crossed derivative. Right? It says when I walk along x, I want to know how by is changing, and when I walk along y, I want to know how b x is changing. Okay, so it's a cross derivative. Turns out you can summarize it as del cross b. I'll show you what all that means on the next slide. And so for a general case, then this is del cross b is mu naught times j plus epsilon naught de by dt. So let me show you on the next slide what del cross b looks like. <laughs> all right. 
OK, so you've seen this math before for a curl. This is del cross b, all right? So del cross b, so for, for um, you, you've seen it before as crossing two vectors, right? You saw it as a cross b before. Now I've got this thing called a del, right? As we said before, what is del? You've seen del. So you said before, there we go. This del vector is d by dx, comma, d by dy, comma, d by z. And now I'm going to take that vector derivative and use it in a cross product. So here's what that's going to look like. Okay? A cross product I can always write as the determinant set up in the following way. Determinant of x hat, y hat, z hat. Now I put this funny del vector in. Okay? Just treat it as a vector. Okay? The del vector is d by dx, comma, d by dy, comma, d by dz. And then b I just write down, bx, by, bz. So this is the first time you've seen a derivative put into a cross product, but it's the same, the same structure. So the way you take a cross product is you copy down the first two columns. Okay? Set up your answers. You're going to have some pieces here that are x component, y component, and z component. And if I think about drawing arrows down and to the right, every time I have an arrow down and to the right, it comes up with a positive contribution. So this thing right here is x hat d by dy bz. So that gives me a d by, d by dy of bz in the x hat direction. That's right here. This guy gives me d by dz of bx, okay? d by dz of bx in the y hat direction. This guy catches z hat, d by dx, and by. That goes here as d by dx of by in the z hat direction, okay? And then up and to the right gives me minus signs, and those guys go right there. So it's, it's kind of a lot of math. You can see why. With all these terms, we like to just express it as del cross b. Okay? But what it tells you is, is the magnetic field, this is actually called the curl. Del cross b is called the curl of b. And it actually tells us whether or not the field is curling. So I'm summarizing here for you now the integral form of Maxwell's equations and the differential forms that we just found. We showed it for Gauss's law, but the same math would say that Gauss's magnetic law has the same form. Okay. We showed it for Ampere's law, but the same math on Faraday's law would also give you the differential form of Faraday's law. Okay. So now I want to just kind of give you a sense of how this math compares. What we had before in the integral form was we had fluxes, right? We had enclosed fluxes. So every time you see the circle on the integral, it means close whatever this object is. If it's an area, close the area. Okay. How do I know an area is closed? If there's an inside or an outside, then it's a closed area. So enclosed flux as an integral turns into something called divergence uh, on the differential side. And it's very physical, right? So just think about the top two equations at first. Think about Gauss's law in the integral form, right? For a, let's think about a point particle. So the point particle had an electric field splaying out around it. And the integral form said, OK, close, enclose your point particle with, with a, um, a Gaussian you know, box, which in this case a sphere is a good thing to use, and add up all the electric flux coming out of it. An outward pointing electric flux everywhere tells me there's a charge inside. That's the integral form. The differential form says, look at it a little bit differently, the differential form says, okay, coming out of this point charge is an, ele is an electric field, and the electric field lines come away from each other as you move away from the point charge. That's diverging, right? As things move away from each other, that's diverging. And del dot is called a divergence. It's telling you, as I take these derivatives in different directions, are these guys moving apart? So divergence and enclosed flux are about the exact same physics. When I take the integral form of Faraday's law and Ampere's law, I got derivatives that are curly derivatives. Okay, And this, they're, they're physically about the same thing. So in the integral form, we had walk along a closed path, a closed circuit. and is there a net contribution to electric fields? Is there a circulation, you call it? Okay. And the differential form is about the curl of the electric field. It's about taking a crossed derivative. Okay. Do I have a swirling change in there? And it's actually it's called a curl. So circulation in integral form turns into curl, whether it's Faraday's law or Ampere's law. Do you have any questions about that so far? Okay. All right. So what we'll hit next time is we'll take these differential forms, all right, and we'll show how these two differential forms in particular 
give us propagating waves. You can start an electromagnetic wave and it'll just keep on going. So we'll do that next time. And we're out of time for today, so I'll see you guys on Wednesday.